ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد فان خير الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ساد لا تزول قدم عبد يوم القيامة حتى يسأل عن عمره فيما أفناه وعلمه ماذا عمل به وماله من أين اكتسبه وفيما أنفقه وجسمه فيما أبلاه He said عليه الصلاة والسلام that a person on the day of judgment's feet will not be moved from their place until he's asked about the following about his life, how did he spend it? And about what he knew, what did he do with it? And about his money, how did he get it and how did he spend it? And about his body, in what did he wear it out? So in this hadith, as we will be asked about our money, you have money with you and you spend it. And Allah will ask you, not only how did you get it, but how you spend it? Was it halal? Was it haram? Was it for the sake of Allah or for the sake of shaitan? Was it permissible or not? Allah will also similarly ask us about our bodies. The body that Allah had given us. How did we spend the days and nights using it? Until we wore it out. Until it become older and sicker. But while we had it, how we used it. And so it is important for a Muslim to have a proper understanding and relationship with his body. And though this may seem something simple enough, it's really not that simple. Especially when you look at the world today and how the world looks at our bodies, at human bodies. In modern culture, there is an obsession with the material. And because of that, there is an obsession with the body. And that obsession, by the way, comes as an extreme reaction to how the body was looked at before. In Europe's dark ages, the body was devalued because the body was looked at as the source of temptation and evil. So in order for you to expel spiritually, what you needed to do is to punish and to deprive the body. Because that's the source of temptation. And so if you want to understand what they did, look at celibacy and monasticism. And you'll understand some of the reflections of that punishment for the body. So they went from degrading the body into the opposite of celebrating the body and forgetting about the soul altogether. So now they may not even admit that there is a soul. But the culture, modern global culture, focuses on the pleasures of the body itself. Look at advertisement. What does it cater to? The food, the fashion, the drink, the travel, the entertainment. All of that is directed at the body. And ironically, it has in it contradictions. If you have not seen them, look again to see the contradictions. On the one hand, there is an excessive attention to food. And an injection to make food more popular, more tasty. An injection of unhealthy ingredients in it. That makes us fatter and sicker. At the same time as they are making profit for all of that, the opposite is that there's another industry. As you're getting fatter because of the culture, there is that fitness and exercise industry that wants to slim you down and makes also a lot of money from you. As you become sicker because of what you eat, because of the things that they put in and the things that they take out of it, it makes you sicker. And you have the pharmaceutical industry 
that intervenes to try to treat that and makes a lot of money. But all of that, the focus is on the body exclusively. And what emerges from that also, and you see that more among the young, the pre-adolescents, the adolescents, but even, even among adults, there's this idealized image of what a body should look like. The beautiful body that everybody should aspire to be like. And that creates negative, critical feelings in the hearts of many, men and women, young and old, when they look at themselves. Because I'm not as beautiful, I'm not as attractive. So not only do they become critical, they also develop that negative feelings about the body and they try to change it to look like somebody else. And they would pay a lot of money for that and continuously feel that they are behind and ugly and it affects the rest of their personality because they're always holding themselves in comparison to somebody else that they see in the media who's glamorized, who's, glamorized, who's idealized, not realizing that these images are manufactured and not real and not that everybody is supposed to look like that. In Islam, on the other hand, the body occupies a middle position. It is not something to be degraded and derided. It is not the source of evil. At the same time, Muslims have to avoid the obsessions of the body that they see in modern culture. One of them, for instance, that when you look at that modern tendency to strip people of their clothes, to look and appear more naked, and that is modern and civilized, understand that early on the shaitan was trying to do the same thing by refocusing people on their bodies and stripping them of their clothes. What Allah Azza wa says, and here Allah is speaking to humanity, Ya Bani Adam, la yaftinannakum ash-shaytanu kama akhraja abawaykum min al-jannah, yanzi'u anhuma libasahuma, liuriyahuma sawatihima. He says, O oh, children of Adam, do not be tempted by the shaytan as he did with your parents to expel them from Jannah. He strips them of their clothes so that he would show them their nakedness. Meaning that one of the attempts of the shaitan that was early on with Adam alayhi salam and his wife is to remove their clothing that covered them and honored them so that they would be naked. So modern culture or modern obsession, material obsession with the body that seeks to strip people of their clothes, men and women, and have them rather than focus on their heart and their minds, focus on their body is a plot as old as the plot of the shaitan. And it continues to aid and try to accomplish the goals of the shaitan. Because when you do this, when you strip and you become naked, the shaitan expels you from the rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal, when he gave us our bodies, he gave us something to take care of. He said, alayhi salatu wa salam, wa inna li jasadika alayka haqqa. Your right has a right, your body has a right upon you. As your family has a right upon you. As your self has a right upon you. Your soul has a right upon you. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa inna li jasadika alayka haqqa. Indeed, your body also has a right upon you. And the rights of the body in Islam exist, as we said, in the middle. You look at the body as the vehicle that carries you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a vehicle, you need to take care of it, not to neglect it. Because if you think about it, could you pray standing if the body cannot carry you? Could you fast if the body cannot tolerate fasting? Could you go to Hajj and Umrah if the body cannot do this? Could you engage in jihad and defend yourself and the helpless around you if your body cannot do that? In order for you to fulfill the commands of Allah Azza wa Jal, your body has to be what? Strong and capable. You have to take care of it as you also take care of your soul. But not to obsess over it until it becomes the dominant thing that you think about. 
So when young men and young women in particular, but all of us, when you look at yourself and you want to assess yourself, how do you assess yourself? By looking at how tall or short or thin or fat or fair or dark you are? Or is there something beyond all of that? Your body has a right upon you. And some of these rights, as it's mentioned in the Quran, he said, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya bani Adam, khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjidi wa kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu innahu la yuhibbu al-musrifin. He said, O children of Adam, and again, the call to the children of Adam is significant because everybody needs to hear this and need to listen to this so that they understand Allah's wisdom. O children of Adam, dress well when you come to the houses of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now there's a background to this. And the background to this is because the pre-Islamic Arabs, when they would go to Hajj and Umrah, they would strip, if they are not from Mecca, if they're not Meccans, they would strip and they would circulate or circle the Kaaba naked. And they thought that this is virtue and piety. Like there are today people who think that being naked is virtuous or admirable. They're around you. Yet Allah Azza wa tells them that that is neither good nor pleasing to him. And if you want to come to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, خُذُوا زِينَتَكُمْ Meaning dress. And in addition to it, dress well. How do you come to meet Allah Azza wa Jal in the house of Allah Azza wa Jal? It should be better than how you dress when you want to meet an important human being. Especially when you come to a gathering like Jum'ah, you do your best to dress well because you're meeting Allah Azza wa Jal and you're honoring Jum'ah because of it. Then Allah says, وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Eat and drink and do not transgress. And this israf transgression has multiple meanings in it that are important. One, do not make the halal haram. That's the initial meaning that you will find in the books of Tafsir. But also, do not be excessive when you want to eat and drink. And the scholars of Islam have said that Allah Azza wa in this ayah had encapsulated medicine. And they said that in the following hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بِحَسْبِ آدَمَ لُقَيْمَاتٍ يُقِبْنَ صُلْبَةٍ فَإِنْ كَانَ لَبُدَّ فَاعِلًا فَثُلُثٌ لِطَعَامِهِ وَثُلُثٌ لِشَرَابِهِ وَثُلُثٌ لِنَفَسِهِ He said, it's sufficient for the child of Adam to eat enough to keep him up. But if he has to eat more than one third for his food, one third for his drink, and one third to remain empty. They said that this hadith and that ayah encapsulate medicine in it because they command you to eat and drink, to stay alive and to stay healthy. But they also direct you not to be excessive with eating and drinking so that you would make yourself sick. So you're walking a middle path. You don't think that depriving yourself of food is virtuous. That's not it. Allah Azza wa had given you this body as an amana. You're a caretaker of it. And as an amana, Allah will ask you about it. What did you do with it? How did you spend it? For what purpose? So you have to feed it and you have to keep it strong and healthy. At the same time, don't be excessive. Don't be too materialistic so that you're always interested in food. Because that will make you sick. And he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, as indication, as a difference between the attitude between the believers and the disbelievers. He said, إن المؤمن يأكل في معا واحد وإن الكافر يأكل في سبعة أمعاء أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام He said that the believer eats for one stomach and the disbeliever eats for seven stomachs indicating عليه الصلاة والسلام the avarice of the non-believer because they're only thinking about the here and now and the contentment of the believer who eats enough and knows to keep enough of his stomach empty so that he could worship Allah Azza wa and remain healthy. That's one way of taking care of your body. Another way of taking care of your body is to keep it clean. And he said, 
عليه الصلاة والسلام in a hadith that is in Bukhari in the Sahih حق على كل مسلم في كل سبعة أيام أن يغتسل يوما يغسل فيه رأسه وجسمه it says it is incumbent it is necessary for every Muslim that every seven days that he would bathe once at least where he would wash his hair and his body there are people today, and this is because of lack of guidance, there will be non-Muslims today who think that non-bathing is best. You shouldn't wash your body. And they believe that to be so. And a person listening to this may think to themselves, is it true? Until he hears Rasulullah telling him, though, no, it's not true. That if you're male or female, every seven days, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you at least need to bathe once where you wash your hair and wash your body. And if you add to it, how many times we make wudu, you understand the importance of keeping your body clean. In fact, early on, when Allah Azza wa was speaking to his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Surah Al-Muddathir, قُمْ وَأَنذِرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِّرْ when he's giving instructions to the Prophet وسلم, to warn people and to glorify and exalt Allah Azza wa Jal and to cleanse your clothing, you understand that in Islam there is no such duality between the inside and the outside or between body and spirit, but both of them feed each other. Your soul needs your body and your body needs your soul and you understand that when your body is suffering, your soul suffers as well. And when your soul is suffering, your body is suffering as well. There is no tension between them. As we said, Allah Azza wa had given you your body as a vehicle to carry you to the hereafter. So you have to take care of that vehicle and not to neglect it. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا. الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه وأصلي وأسلم على رسوله محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد It's also good to keep in mind that the obedience of Allah سبحانه وتعالى itself adds to the strength of the body When you listen to him when you do what Allah wants from you the strength that you have increases and multiplies وَيَقَوْمِ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيَزِدْكُمْ قُوَّةً إِلَى قُوَّتِكُمْ Hud alayhi his salam when he was speaking to his people Ad and they were mighty and strong and he told them that if you obey Allah Azza wa Jal ask for his forgiveness and if you repent Allah will send rain dropping continuously upon you meaning bless you with rain and he will add you in strength that you become stronger because of your obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. And in the hadith, when Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asked Rasulullah for, for a servant to help her with daily housework, what did he tell, say, tell her alayhi salatu wa sallam? He said to her and to Ali radiallahu anhuma, tusabbihina thalathan wa thalathin, he says, if you, before you go to bed, you say subhanallah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times, allahu akbar 34 times, which is a total of 100, that is better than a servant for you. So if anyone suffers from weakness, tiredness throughout the day. Say, I can't do my work, whatever work you're doing. I feel tired, I feel exhausted. And you may be thinking to yourself, maybe I need vitamins and minerals and more food and more this. We say, go and consult specialists for that. But don't forget to add to this the prophetic medicine of this dhikr before you go to bed. Something as simple as that, 33 subhanallah, 33 alhamdulillah, 34 Allahu Akbar every single night before you go to bed 
And you will see the effect of that in the energy that you have. And that again tells you that when you are pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah preserves your mind for you. Allah preserves your strength for you. When you fast and you listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you fast, Allah strengthens your body. See, people now talk about intermittent fasting. And that when you go through that, your body actually, because of that stress, actually becomes healthier. It fights disease. Your immunity increases. Before all of that, Allah Azza wa had made an obligation on all Muslims to fast. That's when you add a stress like that to your body, your body becomes strong. So imagine if somebody does that, and if somebody does qiyam, and if somebody, subhanAllah, is active in their life, then Allah Azza wa Jal will preserve their strength for them. But why do we want to preserve our strength? If we tell people, preserve your strength and exercise, why should we exercise? It's not exercising, it's not being fit for the sake of showing off. Showing your body or feeling that you're superior to others. When he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith, Kulu washrabu wa tasaddaqu fi ghayri israfin wa la makhila. He says, eat and drink and donate, but avoid israf, excessiveness, and makhila, arrogance. You don't want to become thin so that you feel better because you simply are thin. So people could see and praise your thinness. You don't want to become strong so people could praise your muscles. You want to do these things because you want to strengthen a body for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal so it could carry you more and could do more. So you could preserve the ni'mah of Allah Azza wa Jal and not waste it. So you have an answer to the questions that you'll be asked. And if you happen to lose your strength because of age, because of sickness, remember also that this is by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal and this is not something to be saddened by. Because A, it is natural and it has to happen to every single person. The mightiest will be the weakest one day. So it has to happen. But more importantly, it is because this is a message from Allah Azza wa Jal that you are coming closer to me, so wake up. And if a message is going to wake us up, that is a beautiful message to receive. If a sickness is going to wake us up, if gray hair is going to wake us up, if our inability, loss of vitality is going to wake us up, this is something beautiful not to be sad for, but something that is beautiful. Because anything that brings you closer to Allah Azza wa Jal is beautiful. Now when you look at your body, and you look at people's bodies, you'll find out that people don't look the same, and they're not supposed to. And you're not supposed to compare yourself to others or others to you. And you understand that Allah had varied His creation like He had varied everything else that He did. Allah made some people richer and some people poorer. Some people strong and some people weak. Some people more attractive and some people less. And that is not a sign of Allah's favor. That's first of all. Second, it's a test for everybody. As Allah tests the rich and poor with the money that He gives, He tests the attractive and not so with what He had given them. The strong and the weak, what would He had given them? So that He sees those who receive these gifts, what do they do with them? And if it increases them in rebellion and disbelief, this is not a gift. If it tempts them so that they would show their nakedness and their bodies, in ways that are displeasing to Allah, this was not a gift. So if you're someone who's beautiful, and Allah had blessed you with that, understand that revealing your skin squanders that gift that Allah had given to you. And that every inch that you remove from your body is a degeneration and a listening to the shaitan. And understand that you had become a fitna to men and women alike. And understand that Allah will ask you about these things. So if you're beautiful, it's not a favor necessarily, but a test. And if you're not so, it's not a favor or a test necessarily, but maybe an advantage so that you, instead of focusing on your body, on your skin, on your muscle, you look beyond. Because how long will your body last? How long will you remain beautiful? How long will you remain uh, muscular? And if you lose all of these things, what are you then? Empty? Admiring a body is nothing. Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran, when He is speaking about the hypocrites, what does He say about them? 
وإذا رأيتهم تعجبك أسامهم وإن يقولوا تسمع لقولهم كأنهم خشب مسندة He said about the hypocrites who were around Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He says, when you look at them, you admire their bodies. Why do you admire their bodies? They said, because of how rich, luxurious, or beautiful, or attractive they are. Simply, you look at them, you admire what you see. Now, when they speak, you really listen to what they're saying. Why? Because they're really eloquent. They really know how to speak. Then Allah immediately after that, what does he say about them? كَأَنَّهُمْ خُشُبٌ مُسَنَّدَ As if they are pieces of wood resting against a wall. That is that they are empty. They lack substance. Meaning when they sit around Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they are as good as a piece of wood resting against a wall. They understand nothing and there is no substance to them. So you can choose to be such a person with no substance. Or you can choose to focus on something that is greater than Allah had given to you without at the same time neglecting your body. And we have to pay special attention, special attention to two things before I conclude. One, to our young, especially when they go on social media. They're receiving constant messages of what is beautiful and what is not. And that will be reflected in how they see themselves, how they dress. And you see pre-adolescents today and how they dress and how short the clothes are. It's all a reflection of trying to look older and be beautiful. And it's a reflection of a culture that only values nakedness and beauty and flesh beauty, not the beauty of the soul, because they almost do not admit that there is something called a soul. So pay attention to that. But it doesn't stop with pre-adolescents, adolescents, and even adults who constantly are checking their images to understand their value. He says, you are much better than that. And you are much greater than that. And when your body is going to perish in the grave, what remains is your soul. Work on your soul at least as much as you work on your body, if not even more. The second thing is the way that we choose to evaluate our body, whether we embrace body positive, body neutrality, or similar fads. And I call them fads because they're always a reaction to some people may say being body positive is good and it's Islamic. And then others will come and say, no, body neutrality is better. Because when you're body positive, yes, you're trying to be positive about all types of body, but you're still obsessed with the body. You're still in the body rather than being content with whatever you've been given. You want to say that rather than import understandings from left and right, you want to understand how to live how to look at your body, how to look at your soul, how to look at your society. You need a native Islamic understanding. Islam is an understanding that comes out from the Quran and Sunnah, not something that we borrow from other ideologies, other cultures, and then you bring it into Islam and you call it Islamic. You want to understand how to look at the body? See what Allah has said about it. See how the Prophet ﷺ said about it and see how they asked us to live and maintain that balance. If you do this, you don't need to follow one fad only to be contradicted by another fad and suffer the consequences. We ask Allah Rabbil Alameen to bless us body and soul. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give us the balance in this life so that we would live to the way that He is pleasing to Him. And according to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the way of the sahaba, we ask him, Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, I ask you for al-afu wal-afiyah fi dunya wal-akhira. We ask you for al-afu wal-afiyah fi dunya wal-akhira. We ask you for al-afu wal-afiyah fi dunya wal-akhira. Forgive us all of our sins and the rest of the Muslims, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you, Ya Rabb, for Jannah and everything that brings us closest to it. And we seek your refuge from hellfire and anything that brings us closer to it. We ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, for all the good in this life and in the here after and we seek your protection from all evil in this life and in the hereafter we ask you ya rabbal alameen to make us of those who remember you often who read the quran often who read the sunnah of your prophet often who make istighfar constantly and make us of those who repeatedly repent to you ya rabbal alameen ya allah cleanse our hearts and fill them with iman ya allah soften our hearts so that when they hear your dhikr and the remembrance of allah azza wa jal they respond to it ya rabbal alameen ya allah fill our hearts with iman 
Fill our hearts with taqwa. Fill our hearts with your love and the love of your messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulubi, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al-qulubi, sarrif qulubana ala ta'atik. اللهم نسألك الجنة وما قرب إليها من قول وعمل ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من قول وعمل ونسألك الخير كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم ونعوذ بك من الشر كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث أصلح لنا شأننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين وأقم الصلاة